Let's remain standing as we will come forward to lead us in the gospel reading. Good morning. The gospel reading this morning is taken from The gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 23. Jesus begins to preach. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus calls his first disciples. Verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Verse 23. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the Gospel reading this morning. Please be seated. I'd like to invite the Sunday School to proceed, as well as the teen, uh, teen and Youth Bible Study to proceed as well. Yeah. Teen and Youths, you will be following John Ben today. He is on his way back. Uh, sorry, he's on to the Bible Study room. Sunday School children, your room is at its usual place. Good morning. This morning I have the privilege of sharing with you the word of the Lord. And uh, let me rephrase that. I have, mes have the privilege of sharing with you meditations on the word of the Lord. I dare not speak on God's behalf, so I will not call that the word of the Lord. But I um, wanted to share with you some thoughts on some of the scripture lessons that we are going through this week. As the children slowly muster their way to their Sunday school with much joy. I get a clicker this time round, so I can zap you in the name of the Lord. Pastor, I've noticed, has moved up front, which is a bad sign. <laughs> Usually it means every time I, I notice, every time I speak, you know, he's on the edge of his seat, in case I say that one wrong thing that will just plunge us all into that nether realm. But, you know, today even the chairman has decided to sit in front as well. Wow, <laughs> pressure. <laughs> I promise I won't do too much. <laughs> Well, before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, it is, it is no small thing, Lord, to share in the word, in what you're trying to say to us, to our hearts, to our minds, to our spirit, through the times around us, through our friends, through your word. It is no small task, Lord, to discern and listen hard and, and try to grasp that one thing that, that you are saying to us today and to change our lives and be changed by that, Lord. So, Lord, we ask, may the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, Lord. May the words that I speak be pleasing to you, O Lord, so that together we might find and be encountered by you, be transformed and changed. And so, we walk out of here then later on called little Christs, Christians, for we go in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I always work on sermons. When I work on sermons, I always end up with the title last because it usually dawns on me at the very last moment. And this one I decided to call that awkward moment 
when you realize Jesus called you and I. The reason for that um, is, is actually, those of you who are into the um, internet meme thing, you will realize that Awkward Moment is actually this series of memes. I'm trying to grasp to the what, remaining bits of my youth, so I try to do internet memes as much as I can. But there's this awkward moment sometimes in Scripture. When you and I encounter the Word of the Lord, or when you and I read, when you and I go through some of the things that He says, there is this one, there, there are times when there's this really awkward moment where you're stuck and you're slapped in the face and you're like, oh, wow, that kind of hurts. These, <laughs> this, this was one of them for me. We are in the season of Epiphany. Um, I call the season of Epiphany the season of aha moments about Jesus. It's a paraphrase, but essentially, as what Pastor was talking about last week, the season, Epiphany comes from that, that, that moment where you go, ah, oh, you know, light bulb moments or the moment of Epiphany. It comes from that. And there's actually a series of Epiphanies that we talk about during the season, correct? <laughs> Keep nodding, then I know I'm correct. <laughs> so this, this series of uh, Epiphanies started actually with the, the Magi's visit to Jesus, right? It was Epiphany Day. It was not Epiphany Sunday this year, but it was Epiphany Day. And the Magi's visited Jesus. And it was at that time that we were first made to realize that Jesus, a little baby, is king, is God, and will die through the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right? I, I don't know if you ever realized how significant or how much of a light bulb moment that is. It would be the equivalent of me looking at one of my kids and going, <gasps> You are going to save the world through your death? It's, it's shocking. There's no outward sign of that. There's no reason for some child born in a back stable to be crowned king, to be worshipped as God, and to be celebrated in his death. Right? That was the first epiphany. The second epiphany then came uh, during the first miracle that Jesus ever produced. Aaron and I have a very long-standing joke about this, but I'll let, you, let him tell it one day. But Jesus turned water into wine. This is Aaron's favorite miracle, I think. But um, that was the first miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee. We are told in John chapter 2, right, that this is the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples followed, believed in him. Right? So this is the second epiphany that we see. Third epiphany came last week when we talked about the baptism of Jesus, right? And we talked about, and, and again, the realization, is, is, it's almost as though if you imagine one of our baptisms here, someone getting baptized and all of a sudden the person baptizing is, is made to realize that this is God's son. He is going to save the world. He is the chosen one of God. These things, these, these things you don't get to deduce. It's not easy to deduce. You don't see a series of signs and um, a series of hints, I think, along the way without a divine revelation. So it's that epiphany. Now, today's epiphany is a little bit different, but still nonetheless shocking. It comes from our gospel reading, right? We talked about how Jesus met these two guys who were fishing on the, on the seaside. And he says, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Right? And then he meets two other brothers, and then they all start going preaching. We've heard this so much that we do not realize just how much of an epiphany that is, how much of a divine revelation that could be. You see, yesterday, in the long-suffering nature of being a council member, we were made to come here at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Nobody showed up at 9 o'clock. <laughs> and lasted all the way until 5 o'clock. It was a work day meeting. We had a full day's meeting. You know what we were meeting to do? We were trying to find a way for this year, how do we crack this code? How do we figure out church? How do we figure out community, life as BLC together? How do we make this existence what God wants us to be. It was hard. We had a lot of good conversations. The term is robust or active discussions. Voices may have been raised, might have been my voice as well, so never mind. 
But we had a long, long discussion. We had discussions all over the place. We talked over lunch. We talked in the morning. We were zoning out in the afternoon. After lunch, we had biryani. John, John very kindly bought us biryani. So afternoon session was harder. But we plowed through it trying to figure out how do we do church? How do we do this whole thing about as my father has sent me, so I'm sending you? And what does that mean for us? Because the epiphany or the, the realization, right, comes from the fact, and again, I don't know whether you realize this, it's, it's this whole thing about life as a church, life as a community. Um, I've used this before, and I actually heard it back when, when Sivin was really into this guy. So this was the patron saint of missional church living for a while. Then it went to missional, sorry, uh, that other guy that he liked so much, the one with the glasses and the beard, all wearing glasses, man. But Leslie Newbegin is a, is a missionary, and he went back to England, and he started talking about how churches need to behave in a very missional kind of way. Now, he talked about this, and I thought this was very, very profound at that time when I first heard it. The church, and not the individual, is the basic unit of evangelism, right? It kind of changes the perspective of how many of us have grown up with this burden. You will hold this tract. You will muster up all that courage and talk to your friend in school or at work. And you will say, if you were to die today, do you know where you're going to go? Right? T-shirts that we've bought and sold before. Right? We've had little pins and all this. Individual in in evangelism is important. But what was very interesting for me was that a more powerful way to reach out, a more powerful way to evangelize comes from a community that lives out the truth of the gospel because it is the best context in which to understand its proclamation. Now, bear with me a little while as I dig a little bit into this. In the past, I've only used this quote, but I want to unpack it a little bit. I'm sorry for the wall of words. This will all be uploaded somewhere. But the idea of missional living starts with this. God has his mission, which is he came to seek and save the lost, the Missio Dei, right? God's mission. Our job is that we have been called together by Jesus in community to those in the surrounding culture for the sake of our king and kingdom. We live, we talk about a, a lot here about two kingdoms, right? We talk about the kingdom of the world and we talk about God's kingdom and we're subject to the kingdom of heaven. That context in which we live is joining God's mission, is joining with God, partnering with God to say that we will live out this community life as an example of what heaven is supposed to be like. There's good news in that and profound bad news in that as well. Right? There's some charts you can look at, but I, I liked this chart. I wanted to share it with you for, for this reason, because a lot of us think of church in, in multiple pockets, right? We think of church as a building, or we think of church as a group of people, or we think of church as not a group of people and not a building. You know, we're always down that way. But this I thought was very interesting in, in, in summing up what it means to live a missional life, right? Which is every believer, we go with the cross. We go in community, into the culture, for God, for the King and the Kingdom. And, and realizing that, then we circle back to what Leslie Newbegin says in this one, which was the longer context of the one that I've used before. If the gospel is to challenge the public life of our society, if Christians are to occupy the high ground which they vacated in the noontime of modernity, it will not be by forming a Christian political party or by aggressive propaganda campaigns. Once again, it has to be said that there can be no going back to the Constantinian era. There is no more Christian emperor that we can turn to. It will only be by movements that begin with the local congregation in which the reality of the new creation is present, known and experienced, and from which men and women will go into every sector of public life to claim it for Christ, to unmask the illusions which we have remained hidden, and to expose all areas of public life to the illumination of the gospel. That long bit is basically to say that unless you and I live out this reality about engaging each other, engaging one another, engaging Christ in that context, it's going to be really hard to change the world. You see, because this thing only happens 
as and when local congregations renounce an introverted concern for their own life and recognize that they exist for the sake of those who are not members as a sign, as an instrument, and a foretaste of God's redeeming grace for the whole life of society. This whole thing about being a sign, we point to Christ. We are an instrument, we are God's, we are Christ's instrument in this world. And we are foretaste. I think that's something that we forget often. Life here, in all its messiness, is a foretaste of life together in the kingdom. This, to me, is one of the more, most, actually, profound epiphanies that I can think of. It is tough enough to wrap my head around the fact that God would do, God would be interested in people in the first place, in human beings, in humanity, to the point that he would die for us. But more than that, he would find that we, as his people, are the instrument, the foretaste of what his good life is supposed to be like. That full life that he promises us. More than just singing with harps in the cloud forever and ever. Amen. That's very, very tough. Very, very interesting. And so if we're talking about partnering with God, if we're talking about going together with God's mission, what in the world is God doing? Right? What is he doing? In Isaiah, it talks about the promise of, an, of a coming Messiah, right? There will be a time of darkness, but it will not go on forever. The times of darkness that we see today are not meant to go on forever. Something is wrong, something is broken in the matrix, something is not right in the world that we live in. A time in the future that will be filled with glory. People who walk in the darkness will see a great light. People will rejoice. They will rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. There will come a time where we will break yokes of slavery and lift the heavy burdens from people's shoulders. We will break the oppressor's rod. Where did we hear this before? It was the same scripture that was referred to as G for, to Jesus when he was going out when he first called his disciples, the earlier part of our gospel reading. And this is the part that we anchor back down into who we are as BLC. We always like to throw the phrase, as my Father has sent me, so I send you. Yeah, the Father has sent Jesus to do these things. The Father has sent Jesus to break yokes of slavery, to fight oppression, to join him in his kingdom work is to be sent as Christ was sent. And therefore, if we come here, or if we acknowledge that this is our community identity, we are saying that, yes, I'm going to identify with this mission, and I'm going to roll with it. But this, this sense of light shining in the darkness and all sorts of great victories doesn't seem like it's happening, isn't it? right doesn't seem so real right now not made tangible yet i think of things like this hope in humanity restored right when this first came out um, if those of you who are not aware there was one point where the um, there were certain groups that wanted to protest in front of our lady of lords catholic church in clang and what happened was a group of um, uh, muslim ngos decided to go and greet the parishioners there with flowers and they would be there to stave off any unwarranted or any unwanted problems that might arise if people wanted to protest this group was going to be there they were here to bring peace right and you would think that every time people stick up like this faith in humanity restored things should be all right but well guess what happens next thing you know people get slammed such is life right we think that if we stand up for what's right it should be right but people get slammed that, that whole yoke of slavery doesn't get off today. Right? I think of this good man. I continue to pray for him. I continue to think very, very highly of him and think very, very deeply of him as well. Because this man is Father Andrew Lawrence. He's the guy who has now been targeted to be the ringleader of the Allah controversy. Right? The, from the Christian side. He's the guy who's stirring the hornet's nest and therefore should be really punished. Next thing you know, 
the police have completed a sedition probe against him and have presented the papers to the district prosecutor, sorry, the deputy public prosecutor, and now we're waiting to see, right? Because if they were to go ahead with this right now, I think more people will be up in arms and the, the, the situation of our country is just in such a peril. It would be so difficult if he were to be, to be um, charged right now. And yet, at the same time, people are just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And as I, as I think of him, as I continue to pray for him, I was really, really encouraged by this statement of his. All of that pressure. I don't know if you've ever been a target of political pressure. It sucks. I've had one minor engagement with some cyber trooper on Twitter before. Man, that person hounded me into the ground. I was like, wow, I just want to ignore this person and be away with them. I can't imagine what it's like to have the machinery of Prakasa running after you. On top of that, the machinery of the government trying to find a way to solve this by putting you on the table. Just quoting Chinese phrase. Right? How, how, what must it have been like to be under that much public scrutiny? And the man can come out and say, well, my remaining life depends on him. I, I saw this, and then I read um, Grace Works, um, Su In's devotional, and I really, really appreciated the link between that. Frodo, if you remember the Lord of the Rings, those of you who are geek fans, like me, Frodo says, you know, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And then Gandalf, in his wisdom, will re responded to Frodo and said, you know, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in the world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. Not the gospel, but something to think about. We have the gospel version, which is the, the, the Bible version, which is Esther. Who knows that you have been appointed for such a time as this? And what time? What do we do in these times? Right? I, I was reading again, I'm, I'm keeping a very close eye on this Allah thing, so that's, it's very fresh on my mind. And I, I was reading this article by, um, Asian, in, in Asian Beacon, and Pastor Daniel Ho, the senior pastor of the Damansara Utama Methodist Church, was talking about this. It is crucial for Christians to get involved in nation building because of the theological understanding of who God is. Christians should speak out and, and work to maintain truth, righteousness, and justice for all, values which reflect God's heart. Christians should also be concerned about how this world is run and care for the things in it, having been given the responsibility of its stewardship. We must get involved at every level of society as much as possible, as far as possible, and as deep as possible. It's an engagement model. Christians are not meant to be in a holy huddle. Christians are meant to partner with God and his work in the world today. That's who we are. And it's, by the way, not for the likes of people like Suchu only. Suchu who goes out into the wilderness and really does awesome work. You should spend some time talking to her. She has amazing stories about the work that she does with urban poor, with abused uh, women. She is an amazing woman. I really, really appreciate having her in our community because she challenges us to that perspective. You have also people like Mo Fong who is more than just an I love food person, actually. <laughs> I actually, I've never told Mo Fong this and I will continue to embarrass her now. I appreciate what Mo Fong does. She actually left her job and decided to volunteer at this NGO that, that, uh, that encourages um, self Self-advocacy. No, there's a more there's a more appropriate word for it, but self-advocacy, right? Self-advocacy for people with learning disabilities or for mental disabilities. She is in charge. Actually, no, she's not in charge. She tells me she is subservient to all these other committee members who are actually learning how to become self-sufficient. That's the word I was looking for. Self-sufficient and advocate for themselves despite or in spite of their mental and learning challenges. How amazing is that, the work that we have going on in here? 
But it's not that also. It's not just those people. Pastor has said it before, so I get to embarrass Larry again by saying this. Uh, we all appreciate Larry. Larry, to me, I've told him in his face before, deserves the Father of the Year Award. Why? My God, man, have you seen his children? There are three of them at once. It's amazing. Why? Because every Sunday, almost, practically every Sunday, whether he's late or not, he will be here. There was one Sunday, the only Sunday that I actually remember seeing him not here and going like, oh, where is he? I find out that he's accidentally locked himself out of his house and locked himself in his gate. So he's, he can't go either place, which is only something that Larry is, you know, the story in Larry's life, like he should write a book. But, but the faithfulness, the serving of, of coming here, and he's still, whenever we need him, he will be here. He, I made him climb the ladder to put up lights and things like that. He'll do it. Because I, I don't know, that's just an amazing thing about him. And I, I really put my hats off to him. And there's so many other faithful people here. And the joy of that in engaging the world, in engaging the nation, in engaging our lives, the world around us, comes from the fact that the early church impacted the known world of their way because of the lay movement. This one was from Suin. I, I posted this photo because that's his photo, so I get to use it. He's going to be our church camp speaker, by the way, so if you want to hear more of him, come for camp. But he was writing about ordination and lay, lay ministry. Lay ministry is basically we who are not like Pastor Augustine. But there's a long story about that. But what he was saying was this. You know, the early church was impacted by the known world of their day because it was a lay movement, a movement where all Christians knew they had the responsibility and the power to show and tell the gospel. Indeed, many Christians believe that laity are non-ordained believers whose main function is just to assist the clergy to do their work. So not true. Because the Greek word behind the word laity, the word laos, just refers to the people of God, referring to all people, not a group that is non-clergy. The New Testament understands ministry as based on gifting, where all have a role to play, and knows nothing of a clergy-laity divide. It is the responsibility of every member of the church to serve our king in his kingdom. That's something that I don't know if, if it clicks for you. For me, sometimes it's a challenge. We are an urban people. We are in high-tension jobs, fast-paced living, time-starved. And yet somehow along the way, there's this call, there's this call by God, by Christ, come, follow me. And not just follow me into your happy little hovel, but I will make you fishers of men. Right? So I will partner with God. Okay, I get it. I'll do what he's doing in the world, but what's this thing about having partners in crime? This was the, the, the part that started going around me into the awkward moment. In 1 Corinthians, there's this long spiel about... I love Paul, the way he rants. Sometimes we read scripture... And the way we read the Corinthian letters especially, it's, it's actually very toned down. We're like, oh, you know, love is kind, love is patient, blah, blah, blah. The way we read it that way, Paul was ranting at the Corinthian church. And, and the way they wrote the epistles last time was literally he would speak and some poor sap had to write down what he said. And I can imagine the, the rant that it goes. But he goes on and uh, talks about how there's this division in the Corinthian church and why aren't you people living in harmony with each other? You know, there should be no divisions in church. Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Blah, blah, blah. He's really, really yelling at them. You know, did, did I baptize you? I'm glad I didn't. Because, you know, if I did, then you would have this problem. And instead, I'm just preaching the word. He, he rants that way. And the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But those who are being saved know it is the very power of God. I love that. I love that last line. Because one of the things that when I first opened the scriptures to think about this, a couple of weeks ago, I've been like letting it mush in my head a little bit the, there was this phrase that popped up that kind of caught me by surprise it, surpri it, it, it caught me it was this the idolatry of church in any given church in any given situation in today's postmodern society I don't know if we're still called, called postmodern or journey on to something else but today everybody has the right and sometimes the correct right to an opinion we believe that church should be something or something else. 
right? We think that church ought to be more like A, more like B, more like C. We think certain teachers are speaking more truth than some other crackpots on television, radio, internet, whatever. We have those things. Literally, we say exactly what the Corinthian church was saying. I follow somebody. I follow somebody else. These series of pictures have nothing to do with you, more self-reflection from me, but these are the people that capture my attention all the time. You know my patron saint, Nadia Boltzweffer, right? I, I listen to stuff that she, she talks about, I try to follow her, but, and I find myself appreciating the way she deconstructs Lutheran Christianity. But I have to be careful because I can't say that this is all that it is. Another person I'm really, really captivated by these days, the Pope. Dude is doing the right things, man. Where have you seen a Pope like this in so long? And there is this huge danger of wanting him to be more than what Christ is prepared for him to be. I'll give you an example. On, I'm relatively active on Facebook, so I've seen this thing pop up often enough where people have put some satire piece of him saying, the Pope has declared, you know, all religions are the same or something along those lines. And some people went like, yes, awesome, at last we're saying these things. Hallelujah. You know, revelation has come. That desire to want church, Christianity, Christ in our image is so tempting that we have made idols out of our own models or ideas of church. This other guy, famous idol. <laughs> Please don't let him tell, kill me. <laughs> Sivin. There has been a time at one point where everything was the gospel according to Sivin, which was hilarious when I first joined council. Then after a while, I realized, hey, everything according to Sivin, very suicidal, you know. Because Sivin, fallible. And now in this day and age, we have this guy. VLC according to Pastor Augustine. Right? His word is law. For the most part. Not really, I don't. At least not to his wife, right? Ha! <laughs> Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> there are people who say that, oh, this guy is a better pastor than the other guy. This guy is more this and that. Right? We do that. But at the end of the day, and especially on Facebook, you have to be careful. Because today's generation, today's people who live a life of only selecting their own media channels, because you realize on Facebook, which is where you get all your news, right? The first book you read in the morning is Facebook. Right on the toilet, wherever it is you are. First thing you do, oh, check messages. Oh, right. We do that, and if you realize, you actually pick the friends that you want to continue listening to, and then Facebook has an algorithm that keeps you updated with people you like. Um, there's a whole debate about whether Facebook is, you know, um, the, the technical side of it. I won't get you into this, but the premise is that. People we follow on Twitter are people most of the time like us. We don't like it if some person comes and spreads some nonsense onto our time, timeline or wall and says, hey, please, please, this is my wall, okay? Don't, you know, let's do this elsewhere, right? We do things like that. Or if the guy gets so irritating, hide. If it's really annoying, block, right? We create what people have now called an echo chamber of Facebook. What is an echo chamber? It's like when I say what I want, 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 it comes back to me exactly what I want to hear. And the best part is, I think I'm right. How many of us have not fallen guilty of the whole, if I post this status, how many likes I have determines how right I am? Right? We do that. The like button is not a like button anymore, it's an agree button. Right? It is, some people, self-worth also determined by how many likes you get for photos and all that. But let's not get into that. The problem with all of that, I think, and if you don't mind me submitting, is that the message of the cross, the one that we hold to, the one that we pledge allegiance to, is so foolish, so not like that. We who are being saved are saved by very, very different things. And, and that's where it wraps back together for me. I, I, met, I, I, I read this quote a long, long time ago. I can't remember where, but I wrote it down when I was still writing in exercise books. And I always remember this illustration. 
by this lady called Dorothy Sayers. She's a British writer. She wrote this and said, God went through three great humiliations in his pursuit of humanity. I love the way she phrased that. God humiliated himself. It's not deign to come down. It's humiliate. The first was the incarnation when Jesus took on human flesh and became like us. That epiphany blows my mind. The second was the cross, where he died a shameful and painful death. Again, where else do we have a God crucified, a Christ who saving us means dying for us? But the third, this one caught me really, really by surprise, was the church. When God entrusted us with his reputation, ordinary and sometimes too ordinary kind of people. That is a humiliation that I, that's like me entrusting my reputation to John in, in Christ's love. <laughs> but dude, <laughs> you and I like each other, but you know, I'd be, I'd be scared. If he was my sole representative and ambassador, imagine if I had John, sorry, trying to, on my behalf, court Sarah. Sarah would be like, ah, ha, ha, laughing her butt off right now. But that's what it's like. That's literally what it is. Can you imagine appointing an emissary, an ambassador, to court someone on your behalf? What is that like? Is that, what is it like to appoint someone to ask your boss for a raise? And you entrust your reputation and goodwill to that person. That is a revelation. That is an epiphany. That God would humiliate himself through us. When we ask ourselves, what in the world is God doing? Sometimes I feel like asking us, what, what are you doing? What am I doing? Because that's what in the world God is doing. Because if we are mucking about, if we are just laying on our bums, that's what God is doing. When we question and say, where is God? Where is His justice? Where is your sense of justice? Where is my sense of outrage and justice? That humiliation, that decision to, to be God's emissary, God's ambassador, is, it's why, to me, we start here. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, because sometimes we just don't get it. Church life and church community, who we are as BLC, who we are as Lutheran LCMS or LCM, who we are as Christian Malaysia, it all begins with a very, very, very simple statement. We need each other. Nowhere was this more clear to me than yesterday at council because I am diametrically opposed to some of the things that some of the perspectives of my fellow council members. I'm just, that's how I'm wired, that's how they're wired. But my God, I wouldn't trade anyone for anything. Because quite literally, my God, without their perspective, I'd be lopsided one way. Without your perspective of being family-oriented, without your perspective of being for the singles, if you, if you are all for social justice, if you are all for for me, first aid classes. Right? All these things together makes us church. It is not going to church that makes us a community. Right? There's the difference. Some of you go to church. Some of us be the church. That's where we begin. And, and I posted this up, posted this up on, on Facebook again, again, very social media person. I love this. I saw this on somebody's wall and I'm like, ah! That's my community. And I meant every word when I posted it and said, thank you for being your flabby selves, of which I am the chief of sinners. Thank you for coming just as you are, every week, whenever you can. Because when you come, you fill this life of mine with, with fullness, with God's kingdom. There are plenty of people who will say things like, oh, you know, you can replace the word hypocrites with something else. You know, the church is full of people who are not concerned about social justice, people who don't tithe, people who are not on time, people who are whatever. Yeah, that's like going to a gym 
because you're not going to a gym because of all the out of shape people. We are here as a people in need of grace. And I'm very, very grateful that we recognize that. And, and why? Uh, I'm very sorry to. One, one last slide on Nadia Volsweber, but just one. I love this when she said it during one of her interviews. As much as I'm enamored by how she has her theology in place or how her church is conducted, she is very upfront about saying this. You know, I'm glad you'll love it here, and at some point, you need to know that I will disappoint you, and the church will let you down. Imagine that. The body of Christ, God's emissaries on earth, will let you down. Please decide on this side of, it, of that happening, and if it happens, stick around. Because if you leave, you will miss the way God's grace comes in and fills the cracks of our brokenness. And it is too beautiful to miss. Don't miss it. That's my encouragement whenever people feel like, this sucks, I'm done. Right? This is too much. I've had enough of the hypocrites, the whatever you want to call it. And then I'm, gonna, I'm realizing that God is not done yet. God is not done yet. And when he is... He, when he comes in, he's going to do something so amazing. And it'd be such a shame to waste if you miss it. And, and that's where I, I'm going to wrap up with this poem that I found in, in the great big world of the internet. <laughs> I don't know how I stumbled upon this, but I came across um, this poem that was uh, written by a pastor's son. And um, I, I can't perform it as well as some of our poetry slam masters here in church, but I'll try. It was inspired by a quote that is often misattributed to St. Augustine, not our pastor, <laughs> not canonized yet, <laughs> yet. Um, but he, he was once said to have said that the church is a whore, as in prostitute but she is my mother. St. Augustine, there's no real record of him actually saying that. There are various you know, oral traditions and there are various ways you could kind of say maybe it's him or someone else certainly has said it. My inspiration would come from the story of Hosea where God asked the prophet to symbolize the relationship with Israel by marrying a prostitute, Gomer. And that's, if you have never read it, please read it. It is one of the most beautiful books in the Old Testament. It actually exists. There is a book called Hosea. And among the prophets, you know, the parts that you seldom read, that part. <laughs> so, St. Augustine was supposed to have said, the, whore, the church is a whore, but she is my mother. And so, in response, um, this guy, um, Marty, he, he wrote this poem. And, and there's this one part that really, really struck me. So, bear with me as I, I share with you his poem as kind of like a summation and a wrap-up. The, the link is there if you want to hear him perform it or if you want to read it. But over on the dirty side of town, glimpsed between the red flashes of don't walk, and barely visible through the stream of spewing off street drains, leaned up against the neon sign of a pawn shop is a prostitute, whose mother was a prostitute, whose grandmother was a prostitute, whose great-grandmother was a prostitute back as far as they can recall. And she's wearing the hand-me-down wedding dress that fits her a little too well. And if you go down the right alleyways, you'll find her prayers stenciled onto liquor shops like brick walls, brick wall communiques. Up to the ears of a still listening God go her graffiti apologies. Confessions so painful they can't be pretend. They get more vulgar until you reach the alley's end where they run out of room and start climbing up the wall. Climbing up and up and up until they turn into steeples, the spray paint colors into stained glass windows. Forming a sanctuary whose doors don't close, she strides inside and waits at the altar in white clothes. And who should reverse the customary process and approach as her groom? None but a ruler whose purple train fills the entire room. How backward to see this promiscuous harlot married to a king, but as she mouths her vows, they resound as forgiveness hymns she sings. 
In the pews made of cigarette butts and beer cans, every hardback row built by her own hands, sits a throng of witnesses and all of them can see she doesn't deserve his graces. Their sense of justice so violated they can't be controlled that their arms are crossed like origami waiting to unfold in objection to this unholy marriage as they ask themselves who gave her the privilege. But at this altar she doesn't have a right to be. But, she says, he proposed to me. And wedding wine never tasted so good, full forgiveness flavored finer than it should. He leans down with a kiss on her brow, she tilts her weary head down and feels the weight of a holy crown, etchings along the inside read, child and bride, in you I abide. And with whisper in her ear, he is repeating over and over, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. The congregation cheers and rises, but from the street outside, the open doors of the shabby-made cathedral, a shout across the crowd breaks the joyous celebration. A man cursing as he swore, you can't hear the gospel from a whore. But in walked two daughters and then walked a son. They placed their hands on the man with a smile and said, I and my mother are one. The bit that really, really, really got to me were two parts. We have no right to be who we call ourselves to be, Christians. We are taking the name of the most perfect human being, God, that ever lived. And we slap it onto our application forms. We self-identify with it. We have no right to be. But you know what? She says, he proposed to me. God proposed to us first. It is God's idea to have church. It is God's idea to have people as his emissaries. It is God's idea to call disciples as fishers of men. And then the part that really blew me away. Imagine that. You can't hear the gospel from a whore. Wow. How promiscuous is my heart. Today I'm preaching the word I don't know what I'm going to say tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to think tomorrow. Promiscuity of the heart, unfaithfulness of the mind. But God says, child and bride, in you I abide. So what's the aha moment here? What is this great epiphany that we are all a part of? It is the fact that God has called us and found us worthwhile. And I have no idea why. He says, come and follow me. And I will show you how to fish for men, how to fish for people. Through you and I, we will change the world if we will follow Christ. That's the awkward moment when you realize that Jesus has called you and I and he meant it. He wasn't kidding. You and I, that's the grace. That's the gospel. In all the things that we started with about what is evangelism, living on a mission on life, it comes back down to this. He proposed first, and we respond. Let us pray. Lord, in this season of Epiphany, it's humbling. It is um, daunting. It is amazing. How amazing you are, Lord. How wonderful, how awesome that you would do this for us, that, that you would find you would find us, Lord, worthy partners in crime. And you call us, Lord, therefore, to meet one another in that same grace, to see one another as needing each other and needing you. Lord, this Sunday, as we have heard your word, change our hearts, transform us to be more and more like you, then on Monday when we go back to work or go back to school and do the things that we need to do, follow up on the things we need to follow up on, 
bear the burdens and pressures that we need to bear. All these things, Lord, we ask for your grace to go with us, knowing full well that we have received it in Jesus' name. Amen.